Hey, welcome back to the Flicks to Church Forgot. My name is Peter Laws. You are joining me for the third episode where I've been exploring the paperbacks from hell. Um, inspired by this, the paperbacks from hell book by Grady Hendrix, which explores some of the twisted horror fiction from the 70s and 80s. I've been romping through just a few of the collection that I have, um, which I've enjoyed and read over the years. Check out the previous episodes for looking at Amateurville and spooky, scary stuff, um, as well as uh, the last episode in which I was talking about um, sort of more thrillers and things like that, as well as some uh, sort of also spooky, satanic, and um, Dennis Wheatley and all that sort of stuff. Um, but for now, let's continue our little journey with these two. These are um, these <laughs> these are kind of. A little bit unusual, they kind of stand out from the crowd. Um, let me explain what they are first. Here we go. This is... Hang on. Can't have that rolling over, can I? Right. This is the Horror and Science Fiction Movie List book, which is paperback, so it still counts. Um, the Hamelin book by Roy Pickard. Um, I, I, I'm showing this because um, this was a book that really... I loved this when I was a, when I was a kid. It's, it's basically one of those books before the internet... Um, you could have access to uh, facts and trivia about horror. The science fiction stuff was fine, but the horror stuff was particularly my favourite. So, for example, under the, the title of Curses, um, it's got a list of all of the Old Testament curses that are used by Vincent Price in The Abominable Dr. Fibes, for example. Um, or, uh, you know, all the different um, films that Peter Cushing was in. Um, or it might have things like... Uh, um, a list of the the reasons why The Exorcist was classed as a cursed movie um, and a cursed set, and it's got pictures and stuff in it inside, which um, which is fun. So yeah, I um, I used to really enjoy. Wow, Jane Fonda, check her out. Um, I used to really enjoy um, this 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 book. It was it was a lot of fun, and um, it's just nice to have a, a horror reference book on the shelf. Um, there you go. This one is a cute little one. Check this out. The Horrors Handbook by Eric Kenaway. Oh yes, right. This was uh, the a uh, 95p back in the day, um, and it came out in 1983, which is when uh, around when I bought it. Um, and this was just like gold dust to me when I saw this in the shop, and my mum. Um, and dad bought it for me. Um, what it is, it's um, it's just like, at the time, in America I was aware, um, through comics and all these other things, that like monster kids were, had the opportunities to make masks and do, and make fangs and do all these cool things. Um, whereas in Britain, there wasn't really a lot of things that were promoting horror to kids um, in that sort of way. There was a great magazine, oh sorry, a comic called Scream, which I used to read avidly, and I loved that, especially getting a free pair of fangs in the first issue. So I used to love Scream. Um, but also around the time, there was this book called The Horror's Handbook, and this is basically just loads of tricks and ideas that you can do to either make scary masks um, or uh, to, to do tricks. Um, you know, and they're very simple. Some of them are. I mean, look at that. It's just, you know, draw some eyes on your forehead, then get a, uh, a, a jacket with a big collar and pull it up and it makes it look like you've you've got a freaky head <laughs> all this sort of stuff was just a lot a lot of fun um and i did i did a lot of these things um things like uh oh yeah what was it i think this was like you know put a bit put a little bit of carrot into a fishbowl um and when someone comes along just reach in grab the carrot and they think it's a goldfish and just eat it right in front of them just to freak them out awesome book um well awesome for when you were like eight and uh, just gr giving you great ways to freak people out um i did a whole bunch of the things in there including i think one of the most elaborate was um to try and simulate a poltergeist in the house um so my parents would think we were haunted my brother and sister would think we had a spook in the house and this was all like you know invisible uh like uh wire going up to pull things from the 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 top of the cupboards um or to f there was something in here about filling like a goblet or, or a cup with um, frozen peas and putting it on a tray and balancing that tray so at night time as they start to defrost the peas would roll out or something and start rolling across and making these weird noises downstairs it's just yeah it's a t if you want a want a book that makes you annoying it was this and i liked it 
Okay, so let's continue with back into the paperbacks of the novels with this one, which is, oh, we're getting into werewolf territory now. Love a bit of werewolves. Quarrel with the Moon. Check that out. Look at that cover. Uh, that's a lovely cover. Um, this, uh, I actually just, I've read this very recently. I read this uh, in like last month, I think it was. Uh, and this is basically, it's, it, it's, it's very similar to The Howling um, in the sense that it's about this this man who lives in the city, he's living like a great life, um, but he decides to go um, into the sort of the, the 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 mountains, the Appalachian Mountains, and he goes because well, in this case, he goes there because um, they've he's an anthropologist and they've just discovered uh, uh, what looks like a werewolf skull, and so he goes to check it out. But he is then sort of in the backwoods. Um, and um, meeting these sort of, sort of families where he originally came from, by the way. So he's discovering his heritage, um, but he's going along to, you know, dances and things where these sort of uh, sultry backwoods people are very sensuous um, and uh, basic. And so it reminds me of the howling in that regard. Um, but I actually thought this was quite fun. Um, I, I, I was quite gripped by this novel. I don't know why, because it's very silly in many ways. But I found myself still picking it up. I mean, it's it's pretty stupid um, in places. And, um, for example, like the, the main character at one point, it describes him as having formidable genitals. And I'm sure it refers to that twice, at least... Uh, and um, there's a whole lot of incest in this book. I don't know what that was all about. Um, I read a review of this once online which said, you know, could have done with more werewolves and less incest. <laughs> it's fair enough. Probably a good good point. Um, but there are some very dark moments in this and spooky moments as well as like just the all out silliness of it. And probably because I love the howling so much, it was fun to walk in those sorts of territories again. It was written by a guy called J.C. Conway, um, and uh, Conway, sorry. And when I checked out, when I checked him out, I actually found that the other books that he'd written were more like, um, like dramas and bodice rippers and uh, soap opera type things. So I don't know what the publishers must have thought when he brought this one to the table. Um, but the night brings snarling horror. Quarrel with the moon is like a ridiculous title. I think that's daft, but I don't care. I quite like how it's a silly title um because it's a sillyish book which also has moments of of like creepy imagery there's a moment at least i remember um where the werewolves are like dug up they dig up the the corpse of this lady who's died and they're just kind of dragging bits of her around in the graveyard sort of fighting over the corpse i'm like this is pretty dark for this guy who normally writes um soap operas right what else we got here ah yeah well speaking of the howling we have the original Howling trilogy. Um, here we have uh, all by Gary Brandner. This is the the, the Howling, obviously the the film that was made from this by Joe Dante is a fantastic, fantastic werewolf film. Probably one of my favorites, if not my favorite werewolf film. Um, and in here, the book is is similar-ish. Uh, the book came first, uh, and then the, not the the film was based on it. Uh, but it's it does it, it does ring true you know you do feel like you're reading the howling because they do go to a backwards sort of place again like quarrel with the moon um and roy and karen are kind of you know encountering sort of blood curdling horror after going after being in the city it all starts the same where karen white is um oh, sorry karen Beatty she's called in this uh is is i think she's raped or attacked it's, something bad happens anyway in the book um and uh, she has to go and deal with it in this sort of uh, idyllic countryside sort of area in America. But it turns out it's not idyllic when you've got lycanthropes mar mar marauding around the place. So that's The Howling. Great book. Um, or at least a great story. I really enjoyed that idea in a wonderful film. This is Howling 2, The Return. Look at this um, cover, man. Like that is is such a simplistic cover. I think it's just like a silhouette of um, uh, some like eighties rock star or something, um, and they just superimposed and not even got the uh, the perspective right. These these eyes and mouth, and yet when I saw that on the shelf, that scared me when I was a kid, and I thought, man, I am reading that. Um, and so this is this just continues the horror of Drago. The Drago is the place where all this shenanigans happens. 
the sun's coming out in a little funny way casting a light on me um the the horror of drago continues this is three years later after the original howling and they um they eventually they they um they go to the mountains of mexico and they have to have this sort of final confrontation um with the werewolves but is it the final confrontation of course it's not because you've got also howling three echoes where again the warm breath of evil in the night continues to breathe down the neck of the survivors um this uh is this is crazy this book uh, also this starts to uh, this starts to explore like um carnivals and uh there's a sort of circus vibe going on in this as well as just the general um werewolf stuff and there's this strange little boy who's got these wild green eyes who must be some sort of werewolf um it's it's all a bit daft um but loads of fun and just it's the werewolf myth a werewolf story is just i find it an interesting one and so i enjoyed these i enjoyed these so much in fact um I, that when i read them all i wrote soundtracks full soundtrack albums to each one of these books so yeah on the audio cassette in my house somewhere i have full soundtracks to all of these books because i just was inspired to write them they're not the most brilliant books in the world of course um but hey i love them so the howling um oh yeah speaking of canine type fangs uh Zoltan Hound of Dracula. This is the um, the Ken Johnson novelization of the film Dracula's Dog or Zoltan Hound of Dracula, which I adore. I adore the film Zoltan Hound of Dracula. It's I just think it's great, um, even though it's it's ridiculous and um, it's very under <laughs> it's, it's seen as really rubbish by many many people. But I I really like I've just got a massive soft spot for Zoltan Hound of Dracula, and so I read the novel a couple of years ago and sought this out and really enjoyed the novel too. And, and what's funny about the novel is just it it's a really schlocky film and um, it's just it's just basically you know dogs attacking people with fangs but this book wants to try and elevate that story into something far more worthy so it starts with sort of um quotations from saint augustine you know (laughs) and jean-jacques rousseau and all of these other things in there and you're like wow this is i'm starting to read some literary novel but then it's straight in with the sort of vampire dogs one of the reasons i like zoltan hand of dracula both in film and novel is because that that this story is is a perfect sort of cocktail of some of the things that were going on in horror in the 70s um it was a fascination with dracula was resurging um uh, also uh, an embracing of um of the gothic in in life um and also uh animal attack movies so um animal attack movies after jaws were huge and so this uh it was zoltan was just a sort of combination of the gothic and particularly dracula and vampires and also um animals attacking and i love animal attack movies and that's why um i liked this zoltan great cocktail um actually speaking of animal attacks here's a few here there's a here's the novelization for piranha um a hideous death lurked unseen in the river um, Piranha, obviously um, directed by Joe Dante, um, which Spielberg once said was the best ripoff of Jaws he'd ever seen, and he was so impressed with it that he ended up um, offering uh, Joe Dante the the chance to make uh, Gremlins to direct Gremlins. Um, and you can see why, because the, the original Piranha is a really imaginative, well put together film. Uh, it's not as good as Howling, though. Um, and uh, this is the the novelization of it, which just you know follow, follows along the, the the same sort of path. Um, has a few variations here and there, um, but uh, but no, it's fun. Um, and uh, these these are so short. These these sorts of books, they're really good to you know if you want to like increase your reading list and just say just just I had to be able to say oh yeah I read I read three books this month. It's possible when you read these ones. Um, continuing. Oh, continuing is um, the the nature attacks is James Herbert's the rats. Yes, um, James Herbert, man. I mean, like he's obviously a bit of a bit of a bit of a god when it comes to uh, uh, English horror fiction. Um, and in this book, he um, 
he established himself. I think he wrote The Rats while he was working as an advertising um, executive or in advertising at least. Um, and on the side, he was writing The Rats and then um, it got published and became really successful. And uh, you can see why it was successful because it's, it's really well written. It's fast moving. Um, it's an epic story of rats sort of attacking England. It's also a brutal story. Um, there are moments I remember when I, like a, I love this cover by the way, it's cool. There's moments in this when rats are like eating a baby and all that sort of jazz. And so people reading this are just like, what? But they couldn't stop reading it. And there's a really cool scene where all the rats like attack um, a, a boarding school or something. And then another cool scene where the rats attack a train, an underground train, and people are just getting eaten by these rats. The only drawback to the, the, the book, The Rats, is that I'm not scared of rats. Um, I mean, I wouldn't like them all on me and eating my baby and stuff. That's fair enough. But um, rats in general don't freak me out. So insects and stuff like that are more fundamentally scary to me. Um, but if you don't like rats, this is going to freak you out. Um, and even if you're okay with rats, it's still a rollicking good um, book. And of course, it's got the requisite um, awkward sex scenes that James Herbert always would put into his books, which I remember very well from a teenage mind. Um, this is ah actually I haven't read this one. This is the I haven't read this one. Um, but I was sent this um recently, um because someone had a spare copy and they knew I liked this sort of stuff. So they just sent me this through the post. So I haven't got around to reading it yet, um but I'm I, I'm I'm going to be reading it very soon. Um and this is check out this cover, Squirm. That is the most revolting cover of a book I've ever seen, or at least one of the most revolting ones. Um, this is the novelization of the sensational film of the same name from Jeff Lieberman, um, where basically, you know, it's just in a sleepy southern town. They start to deal with uh, a, a storm that knocks down overhead um, electric wires, which somehow galvanize uh, all of the, the wet mud, and so the oozing, crawling horror of worms and creepy crawly type things, centipedes and all that jazz. I think it's just worms, isn't it? Anyway, they start to attack um, people. The film is actually quite a, quite a good film. It's out on Blu-ray, and um, there's a scene in that when somebody opens a door, and the the room is so is filled to the top with these these worms, and they just pour out. It's an amazing looking effect, and uh, this is the book of it. Squirm. I'm looking forward to reading that. What have we got here? Ah, a couple of related books here. This is um, Sasquatch. Yeah, Sasquatch. I'm always up for a bit of Sasquatch here and there. And um, this is a novel um, that was written by M.E. Um, M. E. Knur or Knur. I'm not quite sure how you say his name. But I got this ages ago and really enjoyed reading it. And this was a book that I, I ended up writing a full soundtrack to as well because I enjoyed it. Um, it's basically that this guy, um, they discover a body as they do, and they're wondering, um, is, 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 is this the, the result of some sort of animal because it's got no head? And then they start finding more and more mutilated bodies, and um, they start looking out and they start finding that, oh, dear, they've got a Sasquatch on their hands, a Bigfoot stomping around in the snowy um, hills. Uh, I just like reading. I like reading these sorts of books where people are getting killed by some mysterious creature and they don't know what it is and then eventually they discover what it is and try to defeat it it's a it's a it's a it's a common trope it's a very it's seen in jaws obviously um and it gets repeated in all of these sorts of nature attacks um films and books but also the the the, the bigfoot sasquatch story started to play into that um dynamic as well speaking by the way of jaws this is just a very quick aside um i recently Two weeks ago, my wife um, told me, um, we're going to go out on Saturday, keep that free. And I said, like, why? And she said, it's a surprise. And she took me on the train into London, and, we, and I had no idea where we were going. And she ended up taking me to the Royal Albert Hall, um, which is a magnificent building. And we walked in, and I'm like, well, what's going on? What are we here? And we walked in, and, we, and she showed me the ticket, and it turned out we were going to see Jaws um, with a live full orchestra it was amazing it sounded so so fantastic so 
Thank you to my wife for that. Um, more Sasquatch animal fun in Snowman, um, which is more sort of Yeti-ish. In this, um, it starts with a man who has this horrible experience of this like Yeti creature who sort of murders a bunch of Sherpas or something on the icy slopes um, of... Uh, I can't remember where it starts. In some sort of foreign country anyway. Um, and he's traumatized by this but years later decades later it seems that the snowman has sort of staggered across the country and is now strutting around in the sierra mountains of california because mutilated bodies are showing up and somebody needs to put a stop to it uh this is this is a fun book especially i, I like scenes um where you know the snowman like attacks ski resorts or all those sorts of things i love that sort of stuff um you know widespread panic um and there's a bit of that in this and this this book is actually an interesting one because i remember this book vividly from when i was a kid I, used to, I saw it on the shelf in a chemist or something and I was like, that is the most awesome cover ever. And it stood out because it's unusual colors really for a horror novel. You don't often get predominantly red and pink. Um, and yet here it is on this. Uh, this book is a strange mystery to me um, because for some reason this was in my life in some way and I definitely saw it in the shop. Um, but then it was it vanished and nobody saw it again and I couldn't for the life of me work out what it was called. I just remembered this part of the cover and I searched and searched and couldn't work it out. And in London one day, I was in this sort of swap shop where they had this um, this cover on the wall, but they ripped off this bottom part um, just so they could have this guy with a with a sort of speech bubble coming out saying something like "Don't steal our stock" or something like that. So I still didn't know. And then one day, I think it was about a year and a half ago, weirdly, you know how the brain, the human brain works. I just suddenly remembered the title it just popped into my head and i went oh my word i went straight onto ebay or amazon or whatever it was and i, and I tracked one of these down very very quickly because i didn't remember the name of the, the the author or the name of the book i kept looking for snow beast um funnily enough uh which is an amazing like forgotten little tv movie which i really like and uh i wouldn't have thought it was called snowman because snowman sounds so benign and yet that's what it was called and thankfully my brain didn't let me down um this uh oof, 22 minutes right we need to so sort of chase this up now um this is this is brain um which is a sort of a, a medical thriller by robin cook um he was the guy who um wrote coma which was made into the famous michael douglas film and um this was another big thing in the sort of 70s and early 80s the sort of the fast-paced gripping medical thriller and um i quite like that cover i think it's quite cool um sea <laughs> trial uh, prepare for the ultimate evil um this is another thriller horror um where basically this couple uh, tracy and phil uh, they're lovers and they go on a romantic cruise called the the ship is called the Penny Dreadful. They should have realized something was wrong when they got on the yacht. Um, but uh, it turns out that the captain and uh, Mrs. McCracken don't see, don't, aren't they middle-aged nice couple they appear to be? And all these accidents start happening. And um, basically it turns out that there's, there's bad news afoot for, these, for this couple on this sea trial. That's by um, Frank de la Folleta, by the way, which is, who is the author of Audrey Rose, the... Um, you know, you know Audrey Rose, the one about the guy who thinks his daughter, somebody else's daughter, is the reincarnation of um, his dead daughter. Ah, uh, oh, and here we go. The same author wrote Golgotha Falls, um, which is uh, basically it's it's about this priest who goes mad. Sorry, these the lights a bit funny in here. Um, it's about this priest who goes mad and um he get, goes insane uh because he's standing at the pulpit uh where there's a congregation of embalm, embalmed corpses are in, in this sort of weird haunted church um and then 60 years later um some other priests come to try and deal with the the, the weird paranormal activity in the church and paranormal investigators come in and all that sort of stuff a sort of straight up gothic horror um this is an in this we're coming to the end now. This is an interesting book. It's not horror, um, but it's apocalyptic thriller um, 
called After the Fire. It's the first of um, a series, a three a three book series, um, where basically the world is ruined um, by Legionnaire's disease, and it all starts with this little mouse. Um, and uh, I won't go into why, but anyway, the, the mouse begins a chain reaction at a lab or something that releases Legionnaire's disease and everybody dies. Uh, most people die, sorry, in the world. And this is the story of the survivors. Now, this theme, this was a really big theme in the 70s and into the 80s, but particularly the 70s, the sort of self-sufficiency movement and people trying to look after themselves. And um, this uh, is a book that explores that. And um, it's really... I really enjoyed it. I thought it was a good good book about how do you rebuild society after everything is gone. It's kind of like a zombie book without the zombies, if you will. Um, and uh, there's a really cool bit where there's a family who go on a canal boat holiday during this crisis and they decide we're not going to have anything to do with anybody. We're going to be just completely on our own. And they go up and down the canals and ignore everybody in the world. And so they have, and, and let's not read newspapers or anything. And they have no idea that the world has gone um, to pot when they get out of their canal boat and they start walking around and everybody's vanished. And they realize there's been a disaster. That was a pretty cool scene. Um, oh, and finally, just chuck this in. This is the uh, novelization of Blowout. Um, Brian De Palma's a really fantastic thriller from the 80s um, who wrote, who directed Carrie and Dressed to Kill and those other great, great uh, films. But Blowout is a really great film about um, uh, a sound engineer who is out recording sound and he ends up witnessing... Uh, uh, what looks like an assassination and he's brought into that plot blowout it's a bit, a bit of a boring cover but kind of cool as well um john travolta there but it's a blowout's an amazing film and this is a short and sweet novelization of that book um don't forget that purge by peter laws um which in many ways is inspired by all of these uh these crazy paperbacks that i've read because um, the thing about these paperbacks from hell, which I think is a point that Grady Hendrix makes, is that um, they were written in an era that is different to ours. And we have different sensibilities and sensitivities these days, which kind of precludes some of the subjects that come up in some of these books. Um, for example, when I'm talking about the cellar and that hideous like pedophilia um, thing, it's, it's, it's really shocking to read that. And what I noticed about that in the cellar by Richard Lehman is that it's kind of almost throwaway. It's just a thing that's happening these days. We're quite rightly so more horrified by this stuff. And therefore, when it comes up in culture, it's a big deal if it's in part of a story. And yet here, um, there's something about the throwaway nature of some of these brutal some of the brutality which actually is shocking and um the stories sometimes don't follow the same expectations as we do with modern books um and some of them are just wild and crazy and um and they feel just lovely in the hand and you know um that's the great thing about uh that's the great thing about paperbacks i don't actually i never really read books on kindle and stuff the great thing about paperbacks i like is just you know, you can throw them around, you can drop them. I mean, don't really do it often, but if you drop your Kindle or something, poof, you bust. But this, you feel it and you can just whoosh, flick through and the smell, gorgeous. It takes you back to your nostalgic youth. Um, but what's great about it is the stories continue to have an effect. And I think, thankfully, to Grady Hendrix's book, these stories have taken on even more life and it's starting to be rediscovered by people today, which is really great news. And for Will Erickson, who does the Too Much Horror Fiction blog, um, who I've followed for quite a while now, because um, he's all he's always been great at sort of bigging up the the, the the old paperbacks. And what I do love, especially, and I'll say this to close, um, is is I love the idea, even as a Christian, you know, I love the idea of like you know not forgetting um, the value in people, you know, that you must mustn't sort of just dismiss. Um, people into history and think they were a waste of space or, or that they weren't relevant to us. And many of the authors who wrote some of these books, some of them are big authors, but many of them were just jobbing writers who at the time got a book deal and they wrote these books out. Um, and um, 
and they they weren't the greatest works of art and people weren't sort of saying how amazing you are they were just getting these books out there some of them at least um and yet these books do resonate with people and continue to resonate with people decades later particularly it's the horror books the science fiction books but the horror books that have this kind of longevity um and i just find that fascinating that people still want to re-embrace some of the first scares they felt when they were young through these paperbacks but also to discover that even taken on their own merits um there are some great great fun and wacky stories out there and all you just have to do is you don't necessarily have to get them from the latest books that are out there are film there are books that have been written decades ago that actually may well fit the bill so check them out if you can start trawling ebay and amazon to see where you can see in your charity shops and stuff and, oh and the, the sad thing is i i just know you just know it that there will be some people who will say pick up a book like this in a charity shop and go oh well that looks old-fashioned so nobody's going to want to buy that and they'll throw it away in the bin and not realizing that actually precisely because they're old and precisely because they look kind of um you know worn that's actually one of the biggest attractions to these things so hopefully there won't be too many of these on the funeral pyre well listen thanks for um coming with me in this romp through the paperbacks from hell in my collection hope you've enjoyed listening and um i would encourage you to check out um the other episodes um online and on youtube but also my podcast episodes which has a a long archive of audio episodes that explores horror from a sort of spiritual perspective but until the next time we meet um keep on reading and don't forget the flicks the church forgot